I was more upset because I'm defiled because of him. I'm upset. I'm worried. So I had to go back home and I thought of in my mind, you know, because I take medicine, you know, to ease the pain. I take pills to sleep. The pain is terrible. I'm stinking, cannot see like this, you know. So I took more pills that day, double portion, you know. <laughs> Maybe hoping to die, frightened of death. But the good Lord, you know, he has a purpose, he has a reason. I did not die. The morning I woke up looking for my glasses. Those with the glasses know this feeling, you know. You wake in the morning, where is it? I cannot see without the glasses, literally, you know. But the glasses were not there. Sometimes as a reflex, you know, you want you open your eyes and then I noticed that the tumor was not here. My hands are clean. But I did not realize that I could at the glasses. Hallelujah. You see? I started the work of Hallelujah. And I jumped out of bed, ran into the bathroom to see and then Hallelujah. Literally in my brain, that was the word, hallelujah, repeated like a song, you know, hallelujah, 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 and I did not know that. But I know one thing that I could see, and I am cleansed like now, see that? That was 36 years ago, you know? No more skin cancer, no more blind eyes. Later, as I discovered, I had everything perfect, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And of course, what to do? What to do? Call my mom. I called home. I'm glad that my mother answered. Ah, oh, son, how are you? And I told her, Hallelujah. <laughs> she did not know the meaning. Hallelujah. She's the wife of the Sheikh. You know what's Hallelujah? So I told her, I'm healed. What? Oh, then you know, mother. Oh, this Allah did not do anything. We offered sacrifices and this and that. You know. So, and then she told me, this. Oh, I would talk to this hallelujah. And first, my father was it. She gave it. What happened, son? I told him hallelujah. Hey, shut up. What is hallelujah? <laughs> <laughs> of course. He's, he knows what hallelujah is better than my mom. You know that? But he didn't want to talk about it. But I told him that I am healed, you know. He said, say, alhamdulillah. Say, thank you, to Allah. I should thank Allah. But, Father, he cut me short, you know that. Oh yeah, he's wanted. <laughs> you know, his brain is different. But anyway, that day, you know, it's finished with the family. They were joyful, as they told me later what happened. They were in Baghdad. I was in Germany. So that day, I went to the doctor. Of course, singing. You know, imagine what you know. And I entered the secretary. She saw me. She nearly fainted because she used to call me. The stinker come. It means the stinker is coming. You know? I was stinking from far away. But when she saw me, I'm different, you know. She went to the doctor and he came. I said, Lord, what happened? And I told him, Hallelujah. <laughs> but German doctor, he would not be, you know, you know, sufficient for him to say Hallelujah. Come, come, he said. And they took me and they put me in isolation for two long weeks, analyzing and checking. Hallelujah, perfect eyes, perfect skin, blood, no, no one infection. My blood, no infection, can you imagine? And I was an old man then, you know. 33 years, 36 years, see. And then they wrote the report, it must be a miracle. <laughs> hallelujah. And I did, yeah, hallelujah, I told him to write down, you know, by hallelujah, you know. I wonder if you imagine, I have <laughs> from the doctor and it's written, must be American by hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, and I went out crazy, you know, imagine, you are dead, you are alive now. Mm -hmm. I was, yeah, what to do? To tell people, yes, I was jumping in front of everybody shouting hallelujah. And my friend, when they say, hey, someone, what happened? Say hallelujah. And, and try to explain to them, you know, sometimes short. And, and even later, as you hear it, I went to the mosque. My friends, I used to go there every Friday, you know. They're my friends, they're my life, you know, around me. And I go there, hey, someone, what happened? <laughs> and I then said, hallelujah. 
And you see how it happened, you know? Immediately their eye changed. They were like walls, you know, looking at me. They want to really, well, you want to say hallelujah, say Allah. Later I remember, you know, when my father told me, don't say hallelujah, say Allah. See that? The same spirit they have. And then they kicked me out of the mind. They told me I'm infidel now, I'm a kafir. I am an enemy. And they spit in my face and they kicked me out of the mosque. Hallelujah. It's good, you know. I'm separated from evil by that, you know. That? And started in your life, you know that. But I did not know the living God then. I know only one thing. Somebody prayed, he was not my man, and I was here. Because he was saying hallelujah. That's all what I know. But the living God, he knows how to come to you. He knows how to speak to you, you know? He knows how to touch you, you know? Sometimes we, we don't feel the touch of Jesus, even when he's sometimes preaching us, you know? Yeah, yeah you think maybe, mm, but it's this and you scratch it. This is the way of the Lord, you know? One day I was sitting and eating, and I hit like somebody talking to me. I turned around, but nobody was there. But the voice continued, you know? Again and again, and when I hear it, it was like, like, like a movie, I, I hear something, but I see something. And I was thinking maybe my brain was damaged because of the chemotherapy, radiation. But scientific mind triumphed. I began writing notes of what I was hearing or seeing. It took a long time. I wrote a lot of things in German. By the way, God speaks German. <laughs> and I mean it. God was giving me things in German, as I discovered later. So in between, I jumped forward. 18 months later, I received a Bible for the first time from a Catholic priest. God can use also Catholic priests you know, to, to speak to you. Nobody will teach you that, but I tell you the truth. And he gave me a Bible with dedication. I still have it. Pastor, maybe I'll send you the picture of the dedication. 25th of October, 88. So there. And I began reading from the beginning. And the more I read, the more I realized that oh, I know these stories. I know these stories, and then I, one day I took out my notebook and began comparing. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was the Bible. The Lord of reality revealed the Bible to me, and I wrote it with my own hand, and I was seeing it, you know. I can tell you how you know, Abraham looks like, you know. I'm really. Of course, you don't believe me because you did not see it. <laughs> but I did. So I was writing all of them, and I was shocked. And that was later my testimony for Muslim, because they claimed that your Bible is corrupt. It was falsified, but it's not true. I saw it, I told them, the God of the Bible is the one who healed me, it's not Allah. And the God of the Bible was speaking to me, and I know all these stories, so it was not falsified. I have it written with my own hands. I'm glad that the Lord used this testimony to see it many people. What do you want to start? How do you want to go with Jesus? You are healed, but you don't know anything about him. What to do? You are kicked out of the mosque. You cannot go to see these people anymore. You don't know how to pray to this Allah anymore. But how to pray to Hallelujah? I don't know. <laughs> and uh, one day I was walking and there was a big building. The good thing about Muslims, they tell you all churches, mosques, or synagogue, these are the house of God. So, the house of Allah. So even you, you can pray in a church. They come here and pray here. So I went there one day. I don't know, no, it's just a big building and, and there's a cross there. So I knew that to us, not a mosque, I went there. Somebody standing there with a the black cloth, many people sitting and standing, singing, finished nothing. I went out and shaking hands. Next time, this man, he said, Hallelujah. And I was so shocked because he said, <laughs> he said, I said, do you know Hallelujah? He said, where do you come from? I said, from Iraq. So are you a Christian? I told him, no. He said, why are you interested with Hallelujah? And I told him the story. You know what he did? Next week he allowed me to stand before the congregation and tell the story like I'm telling you now. That was the beginning of getting connection, you know, with Christian. I did not know you have denominations, you know, Catholic and Protestant and Baptist and that. 
I knew all cats are gray in the night, and that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew that either you are a Muslim or an enemy. That's all what I know. But I discovered later that was not like this. It would be beautiful if just you have it white <laughs> and black, you know. <laughs> but my point is, you see, the Lord came and he changed my life. He healed me. And later, slowly but surely, I get to know him better. The more I'm telling people, the more I am challenged. He's doing things. One day somebody asked me, I'm a, uh, Algerian, he was smoking and hearing me talking about what happened to me. And so I said, hey, you all need to talk about Jesus, Jesus. Do you know him? It was something I challenged like this. And it's a question to you. What do you know about your Jesus? You see? And I told him, of course, and I tried to justify and tell him about the Bible, what happened to me. No, no, I said, no, do you know him? It's just a challenge like this. And he just turned around and left. And that night I made a mistake, you know, because I saw the Catholic and they were praying. So I just go like this and go on my knees and start to talk to this hallelujah. <laughs> okay. So I said, hey, Jesus, you know, this man asked me whether I know you, so I want to know you. That was a mistake. Because when he asked Jesus to, to show himself that something would happen. And literally, I was on my knees like that. And, and suddenly, I was flat on my face. And like fire going through my body, you know, up and up. But this is a terrifying experience. This terrifying experience that what I was seeing, I was flat on the ground, my face down there. And then I could see my whole life. The Lord literally showed me my life when I was a little boy. In my life, it was terrible. I was the gentleman for myself, maybe for the people, but not for Jesus. Because everything I was doing is, is you know, personal matter there, for my glory, the son of the shaykh, you know that. People kissing our hands. See that? And I was even a thief. When I was a little boy, my father slept once. That's what I saw. That's why I won't begun. I began shouting to the Lord, ask him to literally forgive me, you know. I did not know that when he healed me as forgiving me everything, you know that. My father midday eats and he sleeps and he has some money, he put it under the pillow. And as a little boy, I came and I just stole that money from him. The Lord showed me my life. It was just a lie. I was a thief from my childhood, you know. I was literally his enemy without knowing that. But the good thing, the more you ask him to forgive you, to cleanse you, he does it his way. Of course, when you finish that by that experience, you want only one thing. Jesus, more of Jesus. Jesus, now I know I. Jesus, I know the Spirit, I know the Word. And you know, God always has something special. I didn't know so the, see that boy who prayed for me for maybe two long years. Strange, he was student with me, but I did not see him. And one day, that was the beginning of the new year, and I, I saw him, I was running to him. I wanted to talk to him. And he hugged me and said, welcome, brother. What? <laughs> he was my enemy, you know. And then he told me the story. The more I hated him, the more he was praying for me. And when I got sick, they were praying in the church for me. And the night before he was standing there, the Lord gave him a command. You go stand there and pray. I love it, you know, when the Lord gives you a command, you know. Stand for him and pray, you know. Sometimes we think that, well, if I pray, I must see a miracle. It's not your job, it's not. Your work is just to do, like the pastor said, follow me. That's all. You don't need to ask him, shall, uh, shall I put a necktie, uh, Lord? <laughs> He doesn't want it. He wants just to follow him. He wants to forget you about yourself, about your family, about your job, about your position, and just to follow, to leave everything. And that's exactly, you know. And he took me with them to the church, and it was like this. I was sitting there, a stranger, frightened, and somebody like you, Pastor, standing there, and he was talking and saying a lot of things. And then he took the Bible, and he began reading. And suddenly I closed my eyes. When he began reading, I know. This is the, yeah, I did not hear his voice. I was hearing the voice of God. The same voice that was dictating to me the Bible. You know? So I knew, you know, that must be the answer. So Jesus was before me there, you know. 
he came there, you know. Two weeks later, I was baptized. It was January 30th, 89. And I believe because of that, the Berlin Wall fall. <laughs> it's exactly, you know. Yeah, it's exactly, you know. Ten months later, you know, the, the, the Berlin Wall it just was gone. And the Soviet Union also erased, you know. Then we began evangelizing there. Imagine, I am evangelist, you know, knowing nothing about Jesus. Nothing. Healing is very normal. I, I, I never doubted that if I pray for somebody that he would be healed. I have never seen it with my eyes every time, but I knew that. You know. My family, of course, something was happening there. My mom was healed that day. So it was me the next day, my mom. She was talking to Jesus, hey Jesus, heal me, and then she slept, and next day she woke up, she felt fire. She cannot walk sometimes, she needs support. So she was supporting herself, as she said, on the wall to stand up. She's a good lady, 5.30 in the morning, she goes down to prepare for the children and for my father. Six o'clock, you know, everybody's down. Seven o'clock, go to school or to work. And then she felt this fire. She supported herself, but she did. she could walk without help, going down the stairs, alone, coming up, and shouting, imagine what. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> and my father, 5.30 in the morning, the children are here. He said, hey, woman, what is happening? And she jumped in the front and said, hallelujah. So said, what is hallelujah? And then she ran up the stairs and down, but he did not get it. <laughs> you see, this is when the enemy, you know, of a Christ, you know, when he's blind in the mind of the unbelievers, I cannot see the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, he can see it in the front of his eyes. She was running. She never done that before. And just he told her, just shut up. And he went to sleep. But hallelujah, my mother was healed. And she was a preacher there. And I was, she was a preacher for the Israelite, you know, <laughs> the family. And I was a preacher for the Gentile in Europe, literally, you know. And one time, you know, you go with the Lord and he's teaching you. I finish my studies, I become a professor, you know, Dr. Salman Hassan, you know. But under it, you said, uh, some subtitle, you know, the preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, a professor, yes, you have money, you have house, you have car. You go to church, you work for International Islamic Salvation. You know, it's a very big organization. They have, you know, branches worldwide, reaching out to Muslims in Europe and abroad. But, you know, the Lord is not done with me. He was just, he just prepared me for something you will not believe, you know. Do you know when the Lord comes, tells you, come? Sometimes you would say, well, can I put some, maybe makeup, you know? You don't need to, because he will prepare you for something different. And after 25 long years in Europe, successful life, married to the mission, I was not married. I didn't want to marry. I don't want to lose one minute. Every second is for Christ. But Jesus changed that later. <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> and I want you to imagine when you are there, and then the Lord comes to you guys, Give up everything and I will give you everything. Give up everything. I don't know, are you willing to give up everything? Or did you already give up everything? Sometimes maybe. We always keep a penny, we say, you know, aside, you know. You don't give up everything, you keep something for yourself. You will never experience the power of God if you keep something for yourself. Either you are dead, well, and alive for Christ, or you are alive for self and dead for Christ. Because the Lord, He wanted to, because He gave you, He gave you all. You did not get half of Jesus. There is no half of Jesus in heaven. Either you have Him or you don't have Him. Some people try to look on it. today for Jesus, tomorrow for money. It will not work. And for me, in my innocence, my ignorance, my foolishness, why? Oh, I want just to be like that. I told you and go to the president and said, "Sir, I'm leaving." You know, where? So to Iran, you cannot. You have a work contract with us. I promise. I, I'm talking in December before Christmas, 2005. 
So you can you have a contract with certain. So you will lose everything. Said I gave up everything. So what do you mean gave up? What do you what do you want to go? He said to Iraq. What? You know Iraq that was just 18 months after the American invasion. <laughs> he came to help us against Saddam, you know? And he thought I'm crazy. And you know what? Since then I don't have a salary and I don't have health insurance. <laughs> and this is a good thing, you know. For 36 years you don't go to the doctor. You are an enemy of doctors. <laughs> Because you don't pay them money. You're an enemy of insurance because you don't pay them money. But Jesus, he paid it all. Why should I pay it again? You know that? And then in the church they told me, the elders, they said, no. It's not from God. You cannot send you to death, you know, zone. Really? But God sent his son, you know, to die. You know? And the pastor who baptized me, he just asked me, brother, do you have peace? I said, of course. I said, are you willing to give up everything? Are you willing to give up everything? I said, I have already. I'm already, look. And that was before Christmas, you know. Can you imagine the church receive a house as a donation, you know, in Berlin, and a car, and all my money in the account. I took only Iraqi passport and $600, and I went. Hallelujah. And when I arrived there, I had only one phone number, and I'm calling it, and nobody was answering me in New York. <laughs> I, I, how, how to reach my family? There is no way. I could not go to Baghdad. It was a war zone, so I landed in the north, in Erbil, you know. And you call, and nobody there. <laughs> you don't have money, you don't have a return ticket. But you have Jesus, and you talk to the Lord. Jesus, you know, what's happening? <laughs> Jesus, uh, nothing. And then somehow I remembered I had an old number from my one of my cousins, so, and I called her, and she answered, but then the telephone was cut. So it's finished. What to do? I decided maybe I have this with the little money that I left, maybe, maybe. Where shall I go? Turkey maybe, yeah, but I need a visa. But then something happened. Next day, somebody called me. That was my brother. <laughs> said, hey, where are you? He said, who are you? I did not know. <laughs> he said, my cousin, my cousin called me. He said, Salman called him. It is you? I said, yes. I did not see him. He was 11 years old when I left. He was a married man. He had three kids when, <laughs> when I came back in. You know. And anyway, so I joined the family and I was shocked. God is good. My brother was working for a Christian organization, wearing white, carrying the cross. They were like the Red Cross, you know, helping people. My mother was a preacher, teaching people about Jesus Christ. Always, of course, giving them some cookies and some tea to eat, you know, and they sit and talk to the ladies, you know, see them every afternoon just sitting there on the ground, outside on the street and talking. You find there is a church, hallelujah. You, see, you find that half of my relatives are already with the Lord. Amen. And then you say, well, I was thinking I am the big boss, you know, working for Jesus in, in Europe. But he was doing something in Iraq, you know. And so you start working. You are very happy, but you don't have food, but it's all right. You don't have water. Well, it's a war zone. You don't have electricity. Car bombs exploding every day. People are dying every day. You are in danger every day. But you still wait for the Lord to give. Fulfill his promise. He promised me to give me everything. Six months later, he took my brother. As I said, they took him and they paid him. He was doing nothing wrong. He was only helping. When Muslim terrorists put a car bomb and explode and people die, that he go and help the victims. And just because of it, because he has the cross. They took him. They left his four daughters and you know, orphan and his wife, widow. And then you cry, Jesus, what is happening? You told me. And then they kidnapped me. But the Lord helped me, you know. And I was not killed, and some American soldiers were there in that, you know. Hallelujah. 
And then they come to, to our house and they put this. This is the letter N, Nazareth, you know? like Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. And mass machine guns. Bro, go. It's finished. What do you want to do? And when they tell you go, you go just as you are. You are not allowed to take anything. Either you go or you are dead. So we have to leave, you know. And I wanted to imagine we were ten siblings, two of us, you know, were martyred. So eight of us, my sisters and brothers, married. We have some aunts with us, my mother, children. Where to go? And you leave the house, become a refugee. And we, our house was not far away from the president palace. It's nearly one mile, you know. So it is downtown. But then something amazing happened, you know. In downtown, there is a truck driving by. It's impossible, it's, not, it's nowhere in Iraq, you know, even in Europe, in downtown. Truck's not allowed to drive, you know. And then you stop and say, where do you want to go? You see, Jesus was there, but we did not see it. When you're naked, desperate, you know, hungry, thirsty, you don't see Jesus, you concentrate upon your needs. And then he took us, we just said, he said, Kirkuk, okay. We go with you, Kirkuk, which means 250 miles north of Baghdad, somewhat, we don't know, we are strangers born there. But the miracle is not that there was a truck to take us. The miracle is that you drive 250 miles in a war zone through the highway, you have so many checkpoints, and they look at you, but they don't ask for your IDs. It's impossible. So hallelujah was there, you know, that again. And he arrived in Kirku and he just said, I am here, and he dropped us and he vanished. Was he Jesus driving his, his truck to, to help his people as he promised? I don't know, I cannot tell you. I have never seen the man again, and I don't know anything about him, you know. But that's my God. But what you want to do, you come here and imagine yourself. They rob you of everything and you are on the streets. What do you want to do? Become homeless? In a country where temperature is 120, the children are driving 250 miles, you know, without water, without food, children half naked. And there was, we looked around and there was a building, it just was like a storehouse, an old storehouse, abandoned. So we went and we saw sitting on the ground and the boys, we came here, you know, away from them to talk, what to do? Because the gentlemen, they're the main, they are responsible for the family, they have to provide to protect, biblical, you know that? What to do? We have no IDs, even if we go to the police, they will ask, give me your ID. If there is authority, there is police. Nothing. And while you're standing there, somebody comes to you, a lady with three, uh, two little children, and, and she has a little pot and some bread. And she said, for you. For me. She's a woman. Normally we don't talk to women. You know, it's not allowed. She's Muslim. And she just turned around and went. I could not even say thank you. I gave it to my mother. She prayed and we were eating. All of us. You are satisfied. With Jesus there, you don't see him when it is hot, when it's you are thirsty, when the children are crying, when you don't have nothing, when you don't know anything about what will happen tomorrow, you know. But God again was good. Because the we discovered later that the main office of the organization that my brother was working for, it was in Kirkuk. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. We discovered this later. We had to go through very terrible days. I wanted to imagine we were literally drinking from the sewage. We're eating if we could find anything. It's a war zone, you know, you don't have anything. People, they don't have, they are not refugees, but they don't have nothing to eat. It's a war zone and militia is controlling everything. They don't have government. But Jesus was there. After a week, we discovered that the office there, so we told them, and of course they recognized us, the son of the Shaykh, immediately, and then they began helping us. As refugees, they began to give us something. That was the beginning. Three months later, I encountered that lady who brought us the pot. And you know, 
Again, you see Jesus was at work behind the scene. I don't talk to women, it's not allowed, but I run to her. I greeted her. Do you remember me? He said, oh, of course. You know, she, she remembers me. What happened? I said, ah. I said, why did you bring that girl? And she told me that that was their last food. And they wanted to eat. And somebody, a voice, told her, you know, to go to give it to those three men. It was me and my two brothers, three. God proved to you that he was at work. And then she told me something very interesting. He said, but strange, you know, since we gave you the food every day when we wake up in the morning, we find food in the front of the door. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We don't believe that. We don't think Jesus would be a delivery boy, you know, bringing you something to eat. We don't believe that. But that's a reality. So make it short and jump to these build, you know, pictures. The Lord saved many people. We started a small church with five families. This you grew up within two years, 220. Every one of us got his own business, his own house, rented or, you know, bought. And I got those $50,000. They changed the zero, you know, they shifted a bit the other direction faster, you know that? 50000 So Jesus finally fulfilled his promise, you know, I will give you everything. And at that time, you know, we are going to the capital because Kirkuk is nearly an hour drive from the capital, Erbil. And then we found a piece of land and we built. We have it still here. Huh. So we built this house. And our first work was very easy to pray. So, hallelujah, it's come slowly but surely. It works for Jesus, Pastor. <laughs> if it doesn't work, in Iraq, you know what they do? If it doesn't work, they kick it. <laughs> yeah, it's strange, you know, it works. So they used to, to get kicked, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. If it doesn't work, no problem. It's not necessary. So we started the mission house, and our work very simple, you know. We were teaching children. Six Christian children, we picked them from the Christian area. Six Muslim children, we were teaching them English. That's all. And the work was working in their life that the family noticed that something happened. The children were friendly, not fighting anymore, studying more, playing less on the street. And they come and ask you, what are you doing to the children? Hallelujah. This is our, you know, war. You know, chamber. Yeah, we we fight there. It is the highest house in the area. You know, Jesus Highland Prayer House. You know, I says to the children they won't change, and the family they ask, and we tell them nothing. We only teach them English. Of course, we pray before we start. When we have a break, we give them something to eat. You know, we pray, and when they leave, we pray for them, and that's all. And we have something else. And maybe you can do that. We put a table in the front of the Missioner. So we have always here a table because we have two schools near us. So when the children come out, so they can take fruit and sandwiches, you know, just put it there. Our sisters, they know how to make these things, you know. Beautiful. You can smell them from far away. Hmm. And this is how the Lord began working. The family, they wanted to know what is happening. So we told them, we just eat them. And then we talk about our God and they want to get to know our God. And then you talk to them about your God and suddenly they are more interested in your Christ than in their Muhammad. And then the first family and the second family and then in this town we started again a new church, hallelujah. We started again with five families, hallelujah. And 2013 we abandoned the whole building because it's too small. We had to have two services and we built a new big building. You know, I don't have the pictures here with me. It's as big as 500 people. And uh, we start what we call an evangelizing tours. We go to Europe to evangelize the reality. We get also financial support. So twice a year, in a spring evangelizing tour, autumn, 
you know, or fall off evangelizing tour. We go and tell people, like you, we show them what is happening. And they come, they visit us, and they go with us, and they see what is happening. And I don't need to tell you, if you come today to Kurdistan, you would be sure. It is as beautiful as Sparta. <laughs> so Sparta is also beautiful. <laughs> but, and you have so many evangelical churches, and you have many villages, complete villages turned to Christ. And you know our neighbors in Iran, they have it even faster than, than us. It's not because of me. We just started like this, but we, our, we have a program, we disciple people, we give them the material and we send them. And they do the same and they multiply. So it is the calling. Was God healing people? Yes. Was he raising up the dead? Yes. Was he giving us our need? Yes. Were we faithful to him? No. Because you know that's it. We always, when we need something and he's not giving us anything, he's not there. But sometimes the Lord wants to keep this away from you. I have written a book, this is the last book. I gave it to the pastor. God's dealing with his people. This is how the parents, they deal, deal with their children. And it has shown you that the, the ways of the Lord is not your ways, literally. I mean, why should I give up everything in Europe and become a refugee in Iran? It doesn't, that doesn't sound very Christian. It doesn't sound very nice. But these are the ways of the Lord. Because if he can give you today a car to drive if you don't have a driving license, it has no value. So first he must train you, you know, you have to learn to drive and then you can get the key and drive the car, you know. And we want from Jesus, you know, to do things for us that is not part of his will. You know, his will is very simple. He's telling you, go preach the kingdom. How? If necessary, by words. You see, how? Muslim, they were recognizing that we're a Christian. I look like them, I speak like them. How do they know that I'm different? Very soon. They come to you, look at you in the face and tell you, Doctor, why are you so joyful? Joyful? I am in a war zone, you know. Every day car bombs explode and people are dying. I was a refugee. I was just begging for, for food. How do they recognize I am joyful? They see it. This little lie in mind, you know. You just go around, people can see it. And that's the reality. If you see you, uh, what we have here in, in our leaflet, you see it's written. Rejoice, give thanks, and pray to God while going. Rejoice. He said, I have seen many Christians that work like this. They are just had a, a fight with God, it seems, you know. Why don't you rejoice when you can talk? You see, I was blind and I, I have no glasses. You see, I was dead, but I am alive. Yes, I was a professor, but and the money all gone. I gave it to the church and that's it. But he gave me money. Of course, I could not appreciate this bread because I was very full. I had a big belly. But when you have nothing in your stomach for three long days and I give you a dry piece of bread, you will appreciate that more. Some people say, mm, but God doesn't need to do it this way. He needs to. Otherwise, he will not appreciate it. And all what he told you what to do. Preach the kingdom. Amen. Heal the sick. Amen. Raise up the dead. Cast out demons. Did you do that? How many demons did you do? How many demons they know your name? He said it. Every devil you know knows about Jesus. And they travel. And then they know about Paul, you know. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who the heck are you? <laughs> you see, it's biblical. Who are you? So if, if demons, they don't know your name and tremble, then your calling is not fulfilled. And take heed to fulfill the calling that the Lord has given you. You have a calling in Christ Jesus. And this is what I, in reality, what the Lord put on, on my, my, my heart. Let me do something. I, I do it for a reason. You see, the Lord, there's, he's the truth, you know. This is designed for you, exactly fitted. This is your life. This is part of your call. If you don't put this, this is the mental of faith, you know. 
If you don't put it, your wife, no matter what you do, even if you work for Christ, you will not exactly be satisfied or fulfill the will of God. Heat. He designed to fit you exactly. It is not long, it's not short, it's not tall. Tight. The color is fitting, royal. It's yours. I don't know when did you put that. Did you ask yourself whether you have the right jacket? If you don't have it, you cannot. When I was in, in, in Germany, I was serving the Lord this way. But he took me to Iraq and to the Middle East and worldwide. But I am a different person. I got to know him from a different perspective. I was serving him from my abundance, but I was serving him in the other place from my need. There we have different kind of needs. Here, you can get to discover your law. You talk about healing. And I said, don't believe in healing only when you see it. The pastor told me, I have prayed for many people. For a long time, they did not believe. And then after three, four, five years, and then you encounter them, and the Lord changed their heart. You are just like a sower, you know, you go and you sow. And you pray and you go, and the Lord will let it grow, you know. We forget about that. We, sometimes we were disappointed with ourselves. Really, how many demons did I kick out last night? How many pastors? I'm talking, taking more time, I know, but how many, how, how many demons were kicked out last night? I don't know, a lot. Did you sow it, you know, this yeah. big boy, you know? Yeah. How many souls, you know, literally, you know, uh, joined to heaven? Come on, amen. amen. You see, amen. And, and this is what, what, what brings the joy in your life. You see, the joy of the Lord is something special. You cannot buy it. You can get it only from Him, from Jesus, when He's in you. You see, it is not happiness. Happiness, you know, as I have written in this book, is come from happening. Something must happen and I'm happy. I got a car, I'm happy. But joy is different. So when Jesus is in you, and you are walking exactly in this mantle, this jacket that he prepared for you, and you are enjoying life his way, and souls being snatched up literally from the mouth of death, and they brought to the kingdom of light, then there is joy in heaven, and this joy because you are part of heaven. You, we forget sometimes we are part of heaven. You are in the eternal. You are not only in the temporal, temporal time. You are in the eternal now. For you, you have angels and sand, they follow you day and night. Nobody taught us about that. Yes, it is biblical. You see, go and read it. And then, where are you? We are seated in Christ. Where? In the heavenly. We are seated with him there. Amen. Now, we are here. And now the angels that are dancing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. They, they are singing. Why we come to church and we think that we are burdened, you know? We are tired. We are hungry. Uh, we don't have time. You know? The good thing in Africa, they don't care about time. I take the walk, my watch always like this. And put it away. Ah, praise God, I'm free from time. You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. I am now in the eternal. <laughs> so the Spirit will God as He pleases. And we finish the service like last night. Midnight? <laughs> Isn't this wonderful to have a service at midnight? Well, brother, we have plans. Forget about it. You are not you. You are, you know, called by the Lord, being put in His body by His Spirit. Prepared for great works that God had prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Amen. Can we go and eat uh, maybe some steaks now? No. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to go. Let the Lord do something. Let me tell you something about your God. Maybe you don't hear every day. You see, I was 60 years old. And as a gift for my birthday, the Lord gave me a wife. I don't want, but he gave me a wife. You know? <laughs> 60, what brother, how old? 60, you know, six zero. And I said, but later I could say, but that's not much. Abraham, he got met when he was 126. Right? 
And he got six sons and many daughters. So 60 is nothing. It's half of my life on earth as promised by the Lord. And from her, I got three beautiful uh, children. Maybe you are expecting one more. I don't know, you know. But the Lord is good. He can give you. Do you believe in this God? He can change your life and make you from somebody a bachelor alone. You know, I always say in a mission for Christ. And I discovered it's wrong. Jesus was in mission for me. He came from heaven to earth literally to touch me as a Muslim, to, to heal me, to show me that he is good. And I did not love his people. Something happened in my heart when he healed me, that he healed my heart, healed my feeling, you know that? Suddenly I loved everybody and we have some Jews with us in the university. Those whom I would love to kill at that time. But a day later, I, I went to one of them and I said, can I hug you? May I hug you please? And he was like, what? He said, may I hug you? Because they know, they see me always like this, suddenly I'm coming, smile, I want to hug them. And he said, why not? And he hugged me. And it felt like heaven. You know how beautiful when you hug your enemy? Do you know the one who killed my brother, who he was? He was my best friend. He grew up with me, with our neighbors. We went together to school. In university, we parted. I went to Mosul, he stayed in Baghdad. He killed my brother. And I wanted to imagine every day I see him sitting in front of his door playing with his children. And my, my nieces, my brother's daughter, they were orphaned. It was a break in my heart. But then again, get to know Jesus from the other side. And you stand here and say, uh, Church, we're going to preach about forgiveness and the love of Christ. If you love me, keep my commandment. Amen. All right. And listen now, the commandment that love your enemies. Love your enemy. You preach it. Are you willing to live it? And then the spirit comes and literally <laughs> knocks on your head. You go out from the church. And where are you going? See? Well, I'm going to the look at my brother. What? What are you going to do? You have emotions, you know. People in the Orient, even a Christian, they, they don't like it. You know, when somebody's killing your brother, he's sitting there and you can't do anything. You have to do something. Shall we shoot him? Man. But the Christ is knocking on your head, literally knocking on your head, and he put in something in your heart. He's lit literally putting this in your heart, his heart, and then you walk to the murderer of your brother, look him in the eyes, smiling, kissing him, the holy kiss, sealing it with army, <coughs> telling him, you are forgiven. I have nothing against you. But I will pray that you will be there where my brother now is. It's, it's not easy. It's my, my, I, I cannot do it as a, as a human being with my emotion. It's not easy. But by the heart of a cross, you could. And you know what happened? You know, my brother was martyred for a reason, for a purpose. Because two weeks later, this man, he came to the church and he put his head at the threshold of the door. In the Orient, this means that you can kill me or you can forgive me. And I was not in the church and they came and told me. So I came there and he was already there, crying, crying. And the Iraqi said, oh, he was crying like a woman. Literally, he was crying. Okay, you, what is happening? I told him. I pray that he will be there where my brother now is. And the Spirit showed him exactly where my brother is, day and night. And showed him flashbacks, now and then, what hell really is. This man, he could not live anymore. Day and night, he's just seeing this vision. My brother, there, the glory of the Lord, and from the other side, hell. He didn't want to go to hell. He wanted to know this God that gave me the power to, I could forgive him, though he killed my brother. And I thank the Lord that we baptize him later. Amen. And with his whole household. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is your God. This is my God. This is our God. And he wanted to be like this. This is his plan for our life. You know, go preach the kingdom, if necessary, by words. Are we preaching the kingdom without words, just through our life? Are we joyful in all that the enemy could tremble, that people could see it and they will question, why are these people always so happy? 
you are. You know what we do when we finish church? I hope that we'll do it today. <laughs> That's that we are changing the rules, you know. You know what we do? We put our, normally when we go to church, we put our best clothes. We are going to meet the king. And when we come out as the children of the king, we go on the street and greet in people. And sometimes we give them some sweeties. We tell them, we're in the church. Jesus loves them. Whether they are Muslim, Christian or not, we tell them that. And people could see. We are well-dressed, we are different, we are joyful. We just had a beautiful encounter with the Lord. My Lord, he did more than that. My Lord, he showed me how Muslim, uh, you know, they get to know our Lord. Once we had a car bomb explosion, car bomb explosion, near a playground for children. And I want you to imagine what happened to the children. And we go and help. What do you want to help if there's a child he smashed to pieces? And one of our brothers, this is how I learned to pray. My prayer is very simple now, you know. Jesus, raise him. Jesus, bring him back. Bring him back. Bring him back. Bring him back. Bring back. I look, I see pieces of meat, all of bones all around. Jesus is going to bring that back. And you know what? This is when you know that Jesus is alive. This is when you know that you are in the church of the living God. This is when you know that Jesus promised you, I'll give you everything. Ask in my name, and I give you. And you know what? For me, I didn't never prayed like this. I was fighting with Jesus. I always would go, oh Lord Jesus, we love you. Well, he, he did not say I love you. He was commanding Jesus. Asking Jesus, and you know what happened? In the front of my eyes, I see pieces coming together. The boy is standing up. This is not the miracle. The miracle is looking around, seeing when his mom who was crying and weeping and shouting and <coughs> slapping her face, biblical. And he's running to her. How could he recognize his mom when he was smashed to pieces? That's your Jesus. And this woman, and of course she was, what, what, what happened? What did you do? She said, we just prayed in the name of Isa, our prophet, she says. Because they regard Jesus. So, no, no, he's not only prophet. You know, he's more than that. He said. And then she began shouting that Jesus raised her son. But, hey, watch out the women. Because if they hear her, they would kill her. She just blasphemed for them. And you know, look at the faith, how God worked. What? You killed me? Eh? Jesus who raised me up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the life that the Lord gave me from Wiener Schnitzel you know, to, <laughs> to, to something else in Iraq, you know. And I, I love this Jesus. I can go and tell you a lot of stories. But the only thing I want to tell you is these are not my stories. These are stories that Jesus, in doing in my life, in my family's life, and through the church, through the ministry, you know, our ministry of reality, when ISIS attacked, you hear it about ISIS attacked us, killed our people, destroyed our church, it kidnapped me, you know, it's no problem. <laughs> you see, that's the fourth time. And what you want to do? People, they need to eat. They, we lost everything. I don't know, are you willing to leave your house and property and run away for Jesus? The Christians interacted. They left everything behind. They could have stayed under the authority of the Islamic State. Only when they convert, they see, say two sentences and they are Muslims finish. But they did not. So, no. One little boy and the Muslim who crucified him, they made a video and put it on YouTube. They told him, it's very easy, you can become Muslim, you know, just, just say it. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is messenger. And he looks at them and he says, but I cannot. I said, why? You can speak the word. I said, no, I said, because I have Jesus in me. Amen. Hallelujah. I have Jesus in me. And you know what happened? They crucified him mm -hmm. on the cross of Jesus. But I'm glad that this boy, he is in heaven. And I'm glad, you know, to tell you that my Lord, 100% was touching the hearts of those evil, you know, jihadists, you know, to show them that this is my son. The son will never deny the father, you see, at you and me, don't deny. 
Let him do these miracles on you. Let him show show you who he is. Let him, you know, just let his joy flow through your life. And so we are helping after that widows and orphans. Until this day, the pastor, he knows, you know, we visit them. Some of those widows, they, have, they went through literally hell on her. One lady, you know, imagine she had 12 sons and daughters, all married. She had a great children great grandchildren and Isis came and slaughtered them all and then she was under the dead under the body so they did not know that she was alive later people they discovered she was alive and you know what she's doing she's Mrs. Joy they call her she's Mrs. Joy the Farhana they came in Arabic if you go there in the camp you look at this lady she has glow she's, her face is shining and she's always in praying and praise on the Lord. She lost her, uh, nothing, but she lost her sight. She was blind, you know. And we help this widow. We go to them to give them the food and the money they needed. And our sisters and brothers, they go on regular basis. We have many like her. So I, uh, the Lord sent me from Europe to go there. He touched a Muslim like me to, to change the direction of my life and to maybe the direction of many, many other uh, people on earth. And it is you, it's me. Maybe he did more in my life. Maybe because he has given me more. Maybe he's doing little in your life. But he has given you also much. But not now. He would not do it. Later, my grandfather, when he died, this is the miracle how, how Jesus worked. My mom was begging him. He was, he was dying. <laughs> it's last second. I was not there. And my mom, please, you know who is he? Said, you know he is. He, he, he gave life, she was telling him. Because in the Quran, it's proven that Jesus gave life. He made a dog breath that he gave life. So, and the Quran is written, only Allah can give life. So Isa was Allah. And she was telling him exactly that story. No, all his lies, all his lies he was shouting. So we thought, or my mother says, they said, we thought that he did not want to. And then he said this sentence, all his lies, but Jesus is the Christ. Hallelujah. That the last words, and he passed away. Hallelujah. Praise God. And my father, he did not believe, you know, until three months before he passed away. One day he came and he said to my mother, sorry. Muslim may never say sorry to their wife. But he said sorry and he confessed. I want you to imagine he's sitting on the throne. He can decide about life and death. He is the billionaire of the tribe. You're going to give up all of that for Christ and be maybe killed. You know, the pastor maybe, I did not tell him all the details. You know how many cousins that were killed? One of them, they shot him here, literally here. Blow away his brain. But you know what? His mom demanded, because my aunt, she believed also, demanded him from the Lord. And the Lord kept him alive. And he has a daughter and a son. Without a brain. And I will send you the picture. Please show them next week, Pastor, if it's possible, some hospital, so they can believe maybe. May their faith will be strengthened. So please don't go blow brains off somebody and <laughs> to give him life and healing. It's not life. So this is my Lord. This is my story, you know. The last word is for you. You know, when you do your will, this will pass away. If you want to do the will of the world, this will pass away. But if you do the will of God, this will last forever. Amen. And this forever, it's yours if you want to grab it. Do you want to have forever? It's, it is like your jacket. This is the life that the Lord, you know, literally prepared for you. And forever it's yours if you do his will. And don't push yourself hard, push Jesus hard. Sometimes we demand from Jesus, think you will, you will think you American think you are crazy. How could you ask this from the Lord? He said, because he is Lord. So why not? It is for me. It's easy to tell him, Lord, 
translate my wife and children tomorrow here. He could do it. I don't need a visa. You know, they refuse her the visa, you know that, for my wife, but they gave the children. So I told her to go to Mexico. So I can pick you at the border, you know what she told me? But this is illegal. <laughs> you see, we Christians, sometimes we want you to follow as it is. It is illegal. So as I said, you know, you have forever, or you have the thing of the world, they are vanishing, going away. So what you want? Do you want your Jesus to be shining through your life? Do you want him to do the thing that he prepared for you? And you want to enjoy, you know, this life that he prepared for you? Or you want to be burdened with your own worries and thinking, well, today I'm not going to church because I'm not feeling well. In Iraq, if you are not feeling well, you know what they tell you? Go to church. <laughs> Is it right? Because you are the healer here, you know, you have him here. Maybe you don't feel it immediately, but he will do it. I give thanks to the Lord, I thank you. Pastor, I'm sorry, maybe I took some of your time, but the spiritual reality decided to give you this without desert. You know? <laughs> so today, I'm just only that. <laughs> Glory be to God. I appreciate his testimony. He asked, he challenged your question. Did you know that? <clears throat> what do you want to do with this Jesus? Amen. What are you going to do with it? You got to do something with it. You either embrace him or reject him. Now, he described some, some, some circumstances that he went through that God showed himself, Jesus showed himself powerful on his behalf mm -hmm. in miracles. Yes. Maybe you don't have to go through all of that, but the greatest miracle is bringing the dead back to life, like I taught in Sunday school. That's what happened to him. That's what happened to me. Has it happened to you? That's the important thing. What are you going to do with this, Jesus? I want us to, I want, I want, if you need prayer for your body today, now you should have been in church with us last night. But if you wasn't, we're going to have it here. I don't have a lot of music. I don't have a whole lot of things going on. But I'm going to tell you something. He believes in a God that he, he listen to me. He says, I, I don't expect anything less. I, it doesn't surprise me when somebody's blind and we lay hands on them and they all of a sudden see. It don't, that don't surprise me because I expected that. Amen. I don't, it don't surprise me when I see somebody that's crippled or a baby, a little, a little bit child that was blown to pieces. Come back together and stand up and run to his mother. Why? Because that's the God we serve. He, he's a God of miracles. He's a God. And it's not sensational, that kind of a thing. It is just the reality of who he is. He is bigger than anything going on in your life. You've got something going on that you think is impossible? With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are Possible. Amen. All you've got to do is reach out. He will never he will never force himself on you. But if you have a need today, I want you to come down and let us pray for you. You've got a need. It may be an emotional need. It's not none of my business what your need is. You may need to repent. You may need to say, God, I want you I want you to come into my life. I want I want this Jesus that he talked about to be inside me. I want to know him. That's between you and God. You, but you come here. You make a step. You've got to come out of where you are. To, you, I felt like saying this last night even. I can only hold this. But if I'm going to pick up that with both hands, I have to lay that down to pick up this. Now, I have to lay this down to pick up this. Sometimes there's things you might need to lay down. You may know what they are. None of my business. But you know what it is. You've got to lay down something to pick up something else. God loves you. Come down. 
make a line right here. If you need help, you need healing for your body, if you got knee problems, you got eye problems, this man was healed of really bad eyes. Now he has 20 20 vision. Anybody here want to guess how old Brother Selman is? He don't care to tell you, but I, don't, I want you to guess. Anybody here guess? I, I, I look older than him. I've got more gray hair than he does. I am 10 years younger than him. <laughs> I got married when, when I was 60. Like. <laughs> He's 70 years old. All right. Young boy. July 1st. Wow. 70 years old. He's still young. <laughs> He's still young. Amen. Man. Me, my guy. <laughs> yeah. Brother Johnny, can we come up here? I want to pray for you. God bless you for being with us.